okay, well, that can all be true without there being a God. It's like, fair enough, fair enough. And, and when I did my biblical lectures last year, I did 15 biblical lectures only on Genesis. You know, I only approached them psychologically. I said, well, here's what these stories signify from the perspective of the psychology of narrative. Here's what they mean. Does that mean, does that imply God or not God? And my answer to that was, well, I'm not moving. I'm not denying or affirming that. It's like I'm leaving the doorway right. open for sure. a metaphysical reality. Sure. And the, the reason I ask is because there, there's a lot of religious people who who just completely dismiss atheism or, or unreligious people. When you know, one thing that I always hear that drives me crazy is like, where? How do you know right from wrong if mm. you're if you don't believe in God? And that that drives me insane because mm. it's like I don't think that I need God to tell me not to rape and murder people. That seems insane for a religious person to say that. Almost says to me that you want to go out and rape and murder people. The only reason you don't is because you're afraid of God. Mm. Well, see, I have a little bit more sympathy to that for that viewpoint, because my claim would be the the, the ethic that you that you have that inhabits you, say, that helps direct your conscience, is partly a consequence of rationality, but it's more importantly a consequence of you being embedded in a culture that tells certain types of stories. So it's back to the story. So you idea. think the Bible influenced me, rather, oh, what, whether if I acknowledge it or I'm aware of it? Or oh not. yeah, it can't it can't help it. You like, think that the, what we acknowledge as ethics is a result of so many years of the Bible oh, yes. being built into our Oh, yes, and I would say, like, even even profound, essentially atheistic philosophers like Friedrich Nietzsche recognize that completely. Well, what about, like, Eastern cultures mm. who, don't, who have never read the Bible and don't care about it? Well, they generally they have, have their sacred texts. But they re have relatively the same, like, et like um, you know, barometer, to use the word. Yes. Steve Harvey. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, there are certain, there are certain Sorry. principles that you have to live. I know, this, this is, that's a very good point. I mean, I would say it's a weird intermingling of biology... Right. storytelling, rationality, all of those things, and culture, all of those things operating at the same time. Mm -hmm. And there are some things that are so fundamental that you just can't have a human society without right. instantiating them. So one of those is the principle of fair play. Sure. I talk about that a fair bit in the book. It's like even rats, like if you pair rats together in repeated wrestling matches, mm -hmm. the bigger rat has to let the little rat win about 30% right, of the that time. That was from your book. Right, because exactly. It's, you don't want to destroy. There needs, it's like part of evolution. There needs to be a bit of survival left for everybody. Yes, there, Otherwise, there, it's just... And there has to be some reciprocity in the, exactly. in the exchange, especially if you want to maintain a social organization. So right. you might say, independently of religious belief, there has to be some reciprocity in the social organization. So yeah, we've got that. What, yeah. what, what, uh, what further than that? does the Bible, for example, offer? Other well, than like these basic things that are, are innate and all Well, we can think about this symbolically, because like I would like to approach this psychologically, essentially. So you could take the idea of the idea of Christ. And so for Carl Jung, who was, I think, the, the world's greatest psychologist, I believe that, um, Christ was a symbol of what he called the self. Mm -hmm. And the self would be the source of your conscience. That, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a way to think about it. The, the self would also be, from the Jungian perspective, everything you are plus everything you could be. Mm -hmm. And so the reason he called it the self was because it's the totality of mm -hmm. you. And you don't understand that because, like, what the hell do you know about you? You are the most complicated thing that ever existed anywhere. And so you have some sense of yourself, but, like, what do you know? You don't know how you're conscious. You don't know how you see. Mm -hmm. You don't know how you think. You just don't know anything about yourself except yeah. that here you are and you experience pain and all that. So yeah. God only knows what you are in the final analysis. And so... You don't believe that Christ was a symbol of what you are. And so part of that meant, for example, here's two things. It meant that oh, here's a pathway through life that, that seems to be appropriate. Um, I'll couch it in religious language, but, it, but it's fundamentally a psychological observation. So it's something like pick up your burden. So that would be the cross. That's the burden of mortality and betrayal because that's what the cross signifies. Pick that up voluntarily and bear it. OK, so that's your first goal. You, you do that without resentment and without bitterness. That helps constrain evil. Life is hard. You're subject to malevolence. You accept that without bitterness. Mm. And that, that's, a, that's a heroic act that's because true. really, yeah. really, you're going to take that on full, fully? Right. So that helps you transcend that suffering. Say, well, and then well, something in me has to die because it was really wrong. And that's why I made this mistake. And that's so mm -hmm. goddamn painful. And mm. you barely get through it. But then you, you reemerge from that underworld and you're a better person for it. And so Christ is a symbol of that thing that dies and is reborn and dies and is reborn. And so that's, I like so that. that's, it's, it's nice. the, yeah. yeah, oh yeah, it's a, it's a, Jung is an extraordinarily powerful I love, thinker. I love thinking about it more in like, you know, the psychological yeah. standpoint yeah. than literal, which yeah, a lot of people at, do do well, that. We're at the point where the psychological interpretation is necessary if these ideas are going to survive. Mm. Right. So now you might, so then, and then the last thing would be, and this is also extraordinary, this is extraordinarily useful to consider from a psychological perspective. It's like, well, who should the king bow down to? Hi, well, no Harry. one, okay, because he's the king. There's no one above the king because there's no transcendent deity. There's no transcendent good. There's the king. Okay, well, that means the king can do whatever he wants. Well, that's no good because then everyone dies, right? It's like ultimate tyranny. So, so then imagine if you did something like this. Imagine you took a uh, hundred common people, 
you know, a thousand common people, and you distilled what was the best in them into ten noblemen. Mm. Then you took ten noblemen and you distilled them into a king. Then you took ten kings and you said, okay, what's king-like about them? Mm. So what's the essence of being a king? Mm. And then you made that into a symbol. You said, mm. okay, all you kings, you bow down to this the this, symbol this that's above idea. you. Yeah, that's Christ. Yeah. That's, mm. that's the role that that symbol plays in. Cool. Yeah, that's and that's a union. Like that. inter- oh, God. That's, that's great. A I've never heard this yeah. stuff. Yeah, well, but, this but you see that in a lot of the symbolic language because mm-hmm. one of the ways that Christ is put forward is as the king of kings. He's a king, right? And that actually means something. That, there's a, it's such a funny statement because it's actually a description of how the idea was generated. It's mm-hmm. like, or, or you could think about it this way. It's interesting to think that people so intentionally were so intentional with their writing of the Bible. Like, that's kind of genius literature that... Yeah. that People don't even think about approaching literature that way anymore. But I yeah. guess the need for it is not as much as it used to be. Well, the need is there, it's, but we confuse the literal. In the, we don't understand how to approach the stories. We don't understand, for example, that there's a truth in fiction that's different than mm. the truth in science, mm. but that's still true. Right. So, yeah. Let's so, well, let's, so let's, one more, what, just one more thing. Oh, yeah, go ahead, well, yeah. So in the Christian drama, the, the world is laid out, and I talk about this particularly in Rule 7, which is do what is meaningful, not what is expedient. It's like the... The, the reality that Christ confronts archetypally, so the story is very stark, right? And the reason it's an archetypal story is, well, what's the worst possible story? Well, that's easy. The worst possible story is the most innocent possible person gets tortured the worst possible way because everyone betrays him, mm. even though he didn't do anything wrong. Mm. Right. Okay, well, so you can't push that story any farther, so you hit a limit. Sure. And so then, so you have that limit case, and then you think, well, what do you do about that? You die and you're reborn because you can <laughs> transcend that. But, so, there's limit cases in, in the Christian story all the time because what Christ encounters is... The, the tragic suffering associated with mortality. Uh, that's the crucifixion, right? That was a terrible form of torture. And the fact that it comes about because of betrayal and malevolence. It's like, well, that's your life. Like, that's life. It's suffering tainted with malevolence. And that's the world that you inhabit. Everyone. So how do you deal with that? You take it on voluntarily. You try to constrain malevolence. And you allow the parts of yourself that are unworthy to die and be reborn. Mm. It's like, that's the psychological interpretation. You might say, well, is there something metaphysical over above that? You know, was Christ genuinely the son of God? Well, that's a different question. Sure. And so, but I also think, I've had this intuition, you know, that sometimes that the material world organizes itself in in a way to reach up to the spiritual world mm. and that the spiritual world arranges itself to reach down to the material world and sometimes they touch mm. and maybe they touched in the case of socrates you know and maybe they touched in the case of the buddha and maybe they touched in the case of christ mm.